Hello, here we are at online lecture number 21. Last time we spoke about nucleophilic substitution reactions, SN1 and SN2. Generally, the equation was a nucleophile reacts with an electrophile to form products in the substitution reaction. And we defined a SN2 reaction is a single step reaction where both the nucleophile and the electrophile, a halogenoalkane, react together via a transition state to form the products. And since both reactants, nucleophile and electrophile, need to meet for the reaction to take place, the rate of this SN2 reaction depends on both the concentration of the nucleophile and the concentration of the electrophile times the rate constant. So for SN1 reactions, on the other hand, these are two-step reactions, and the rate-limiting step is the formation of a carbocation only the carbocation then reacts with the nucleophile to produce the product in the substitution reaction. And that's why it is a first order reaction. It only depends on the concentration on the, of the um, halogenoalkane in the first place, since this is the rate determining step. So today we speak about a different type of reaction that's called an elimination reaction, an E1 we begin with. It's uh, unimolecular one, so as you can see, it's related similar to the SN1 to the formation of a intermediate state in a two-step process. And here is an example. So we have again what you already see before, a halogenoalkane, and it reacts with a base. Now, this we really define this as a base, not only a nucleophile, but in principle, a base also is a nucleophile. So Normally, you would expect this to happen, right? A nucleophilic substitution reaction. So the hydroxide would just substitute the bromine and it would split off as a bromide. But in fact, it's not what's happening. How is that? And what happens instead? This is what happens instead. Instead of substituting the bromine, the hydroxide with its lone pair, it steals a proton from one of these methyl groups and forms a water. And as a result, the bromide splits off and our halogenoalkane forms an alkene with a pi bond. Hmm. Let's understand why is that happening in this situation. So here's our halogenoalkane. And since you've already anticipated properly, it's an E1 reaction. So it forms a carbocation intermediate on its own without there being any interaction with the hydroxide. So this, this carbocation now, it is stabilized again, of course, by inductive effects and also by this hyperconjugation, where some of these sp3 sigma bonds from the methyl groups are overlapping with the empty p orbital of the carbocation and this way they stabilize the carbocation. Here is actually a computer simulation and the computer simulation shows really nicely the delocalization of the electrons by this hyperconjugation. So the surface plot here shows the area where the electrons can be found um, and, and that lowers the energy and stabilizes the carbocation. So now what happens is because of this overlap, the electron density is taken away from these CH bonds, right? These sp3 orbitals, they are having now a reduced electron density. And what that does is it strengthens the CC bonds, right? But it weakens the CH bonds here. And that weakening of the CH sigma bond makes the hydrogen here become more acidic. Right? That means it can more easily split off as a proton. And you can see where this leads to, since we have a base involved in the reaction in the second step. Now, the weakening of the hydrogen um, carbon bond um, facilitates this um, base to steal the, the proton from, from the molecule. So let's look at it a little closer. So let's consider again, it would be a nucleophilic substitution reaction where 
Now our hydroxide, our base, it would have to attack the central positively charged carbon cation, right? It would have to interact with the empty p orbital of this uh, carbocation center, but this is sterically hindered, as you can see here. These are approximately the 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 area, the the volumes that are occupied um, um, by the electrons, and they are not allowing the hydroxide to access the central carbon um, to to make a nucleophilic substitution. So it can't reach the C because of the steric hindrance by the hydrogens. What it does instead, since one of the hydrogens from each methyl groups has become more acidic due to hyperconjugation, it performs a nucleophilic attack on the hydrogen. Right? It's also a nucleophilic attack, just not on the central carbon, but it's a nucleophilic attack on one of the hydrogens. So the um, hydroxide attacks the slightly acidic hydrogen, and as a result, the electron pair between the carbon and the hydrogen from the sigma bond jumps in between the two carbons and forms another pi bond. And the proton splits off together with the nucleophile to form a water molecule. Right? So, and we get a, pro a propene molecule at the end. So, the base um, has a lone pair and um, the base could be a hydroxide, but it could also be an NH2 minus or an NH3, right? All of these, they have lone pairs um, and they can act as uh, proton grabbers um, and carry out this nucleophilic attack on the, on the hydrogen. So, and this is the more general definition of an acid-base reaction, actually. So we learned a little uh, about the uh, uh, brownstedt lowry theory um, when we talked about acid-base equilibrium. Um, but this is more general here. Um, we, did, we call this now a Lewis base. And a, the, the, the general feature of a Lewis base is that it is a good donor of electrons, while a Lewis acid, which is in this case the electrophile here, is a good acceptor of electrons. Right? So an acid-base uh, reaction, which is what we have here, um, can be defined based on proton donation and proton exception, acid-base, that's Brownstedt-Lorry, but you can also call it um, a, a, a donation of electrons or an exception of ele electrons, so a nucleophile-electrophile interaction. And that's a more general definition of an acid-base uh, um, reaction, and that's called a Lewis acid-base interaction. So now, since the um, carbocation is uh, uh, the, the rate determining step, um, the rate of the of the um, of this attack of the base on on the on the proton on the hydrogen here is determined by the stability of the carbocation, and that stability can come from mesomeric, from inductive, or from hyperconjugation, right? And the more stable the carbocation, the higher the E1, the elimination one reaction rate will be. So elimination reactions, um, E1 reactions, are two-step reactions, right? Because first the carbocation is formed, and then the nucleophile, or the hydroxide, the base, can attack. So the step that's important is the formation of the carbocation. And that's just like in an SN1 reaction, the rate of the reaction depends on only the concentration of the halogenoalkan that forms the, um, the carbocation. So the second type of elimination reaction is the E2 reaction. And it's just like with SN1 and SN2, the two now tells us that this is a bimolecular reaction. Both reactants, the base, and the halogenoalkane, they have to meet. And the outcome is the same, just the mechanism is different. We form a propene in this example, a bromine, a bromide, and a water molecule. And now, because there is insufficient um, hyperconjugation or no, su not sufficient plus inductive effect, there can't be a carbocation form simply, right? Um, just like in the SN2 reaction. Um, and, and therefore, the rate of the reaction depends on both the concentration of the halogenoalkane and the concentration of the base. Both of them, they need to meet in a single step, forming the product via a transition state, um, 
without intermediate. And um, unlike in the case where you have uh, the carbocation that is then susceptible to the nucleophilic attack, here there is no MTP orbital, right? Carbocation has an MTP orbital. This one here doesn't have an MTP orbital. So the question is, which one is the LUMO in the um, reactant, in the halogenoalkane? And in this case, just like for the SN2 reaction, the LUMO is actually a um, empty sigma star orbital, an anti-bonding sigma orbital. So here's our base. The base has a lone pair of electrons in a p orbital. It's negatively charged. And here is our halogenoalkane. It's the halogen, a bromine in this example. And now um, here is a drawing of the sp3 hybridized carbon at one end. And now this um, is a filled sigma orbital that has some interaction via hyperconjugation with the empty sigma star orbital of the carbon halogen bond, X standing here for halogen. And now there is, as you know, in hyperconjugation, there's some alignment of two orbitals from different atoms, adjacent atoms, and the alignment of the um, sp3 sigma here and the uh, sigma star of the halogenoalkane. Um, that causes this interaction, which I highlight with these red wiggly, wiggly lines. And now when the base attacks, it attacks the sp3 orbital, the sigma bond, and that causes then electron density to move over to this empty sigma star. And as a result, a pi bond, a double bond is formed and the bromine, bromide splits off with a lone pair. And the base grabs the, the hydrogen or the proton forming a water molecule often or a base that has that is protonated now. So, a filled p orbital is the, the result of the, the reaction and a new zigma. So now I want to depict the reaction in curly arrow notation. So first what happens is that the base is donating electrons to the hydrogen. Since the hydrogen is slightly more acidic, right? Now the Lewis base is donating electrons to this uh, Lewis acid um, and as a result the um, electrons that are shared between the carbon and the hydrogen in this sigma bonds, they can now move from the sigma bond to the sigma star between the carbon and the bromine. Now that's important because as a result of this happening, the bond, the sigma bond between the carbon and the bromine breaks. And why does it break? So you see the energy diagram, the this carbon and the bromine, they have a sigma bond filled with two electrons, right? And that lowers the energy of, of them and causes them to be bound. But now if the antibonding sigma star is filled from the electrons that come from the CH, then the occupation of this high energy level here neutralizes the energy reduction that comes from the sigma bond. The two cancel each other and essentially there's no more energy reduction and that causes the bromide to break off. Right? So that's basically what's written here. That's the mechanism of, of this um, um, reaction. Right? So the whole reaction happens place as a, even though with the curly arrows it looks like step one, step two, step three, but all of these three steps they happen simultaneously and here's a computer simulation of the intermediate um, state, or sorry, the transition state of this um, um, molecule. So the base um, with its lone pair is now um, donating electron density to, to the um, sigma bond. The pi bond starts to form between the two carbons and the um, sigma bond between the carbon and the halogen. Um, starts breaking and a lone pair begins to form. So this in in transition state um, um, is, is there. And all of these three steps happen simultaneously. We call this a concerted reaction. Well, that's it for this week. Um, I introduced you to um, different types of chemical reactions. We spoke about um, uh, addition reaction, a, a nucleophilic addition reaction. We spoke about um, nucleophilic substitution reactions, uh, SN1 and SN2. 
then we um, discussed at the end elimination reactions um, that was E1 and E2 and you learned um, how their rates depend on the mechanism of the reactions. All the mechanisms again were determined by analyzing the kinetics um, or the, the, the speeds of the reactions and then fitting it with models. So here you see really nicely how um, fundamental chemistry can be explained um, based on looking at how the rate laws of reactions look like. Okay, then see you next week, the last week. Um, good luck studying. Bye-bye.